Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency. Today we're going to be talking about extreme weather. In so many regions of the U.S., building resilience means preparing for changing and potentially extreme weather. And that threat of extreme weather is a particular problem if your region is likely to experience new kinds of storms. In this look at extreme weather trends, we're going to be talking about the emerging scientific consensus around changing patterns for precipitation, then dive into projections for two of the most common destructive inland weather events, hail and tornadoes. We'll also be looking through some of the most potentially controversial modeling related to bombogenesis events. There's not as high of consensus research on bombogenesis, but if you're in a coastal area particularly, it's worth keeping an eye on trends in this dangerous weather phenomena. I bet many of you have not had a chance to look at the big picture on precipitation before, so let's take a look together. I'm going to leave these figures up for quite a while so you can study them while I walk through some of the changes with you, give you some points of interest across the nation. These national figures show the anticipated changes to precipitation over much of the year as we approach mid-century. And I want you to be thinking about these precipitation trends in the context of increasingly extreme storms. So if you're seeing more precipitation on this map, that's not necessarily more days of a mild or typical amount of precipitation. It probably means that a lot of the rain or snow will be concentrated that season in substantial precipitation events. That type of intensification is our overall trend predicted nationally. When it rains, it'll pour. When it's dry, it'll be quite dry. Now, looking at those maps, we can see that these colors indicate percentage change. And I want you to also focus for a second on this crosshatching. These areas that are crosshatched, that's where we have higher confidence that the anticipated trends will hold from year to year. In areas that aren't crosshatched, you'd anticipate higher year to year variability instead of a steady trend. You've been seeing here that the Southwest, it's not anticipated to get out of that terrible drought they've been experiencing anytime soon. If you follow the news, you know about what's going on with the water situation in the lower Colorado Basin. You can overlay these precipitation patterns on that. You see we have a very challenging water picture for much of the Southwest. But let's not make it worse than it is, because you see the drought map for the Southwest is most dramatic in the summer, right? And does it normally rain a lot in the summer in those areas? It doesn't. They mostly get rain in the winter and spring. So particularly over here on the Pacific Coast, Let's focus on the changes to that winter and spring precipitation. If we look at that, those times when rain normally falls in any profusion, we can see that the drought trend becomes much less severe as we move north California's central coast. Overall, we need to remember, we're looking at these precipitation trends in the context of higher temperatures. So when we see this very dry summer outlook almost universal across the U.S., it's going to be dry in the context of higher water needs. The soil will dry out faster in the higher temperatures. Plants and other living things, they're going to need more water. Even in areas that have never used irrigation before, that have relied on summer precipitation for field crops, there's some real potential that we'll be moving towards water storage in the spring, both rainwater storage and groundwater recharge, and then irrigation to finish out the growing season. That's a major challenge and in some ways an opportunity afforded by this increased spring and winter precipitation you see broadly across the whole emerging growing stuff zone, as well as this area with a lot of conservation potential in northern New England. As a note on winter precipitation, you'll notice there are a few mountain areas looking at statistically significant increased winter precipitation, looking at you in particular Colorado, because check out your spring trends. For Colorado, there's not a lot more precipitation projected in the spring, just in the winter. Hopefully this means no big spring rains will be coming to melt your snowpack, give you some fairly steady snowpack, um, fairly steady stream flow. Fingers crossed, my friends. I know there's a lot more I could talk about on this map. I mean, look at the drought trends for Florida. That's worth noting. As is the relative stability there on the spine of lower Appalachia going into the top of Georgia. If you're in Kansas, the potential indicated by these trends for sustainable aquifer recharge and draw, particularly in eastern Kansas, nice bit of information. But if I talk about this map all day, I'm not going to get to hail. And the hail stuff is a very important challenge to consider as we build resilience. In many parts of the country, we're going to be trying to get new plants established. Tender plants, young plants, they can get just shredded by hail. But if you're aware of changing trends, you can protect your plants. And make sure that your resilience plan includes appropriate cover for other vulnerable living things and resources. As we experience overall warming trends as we move towards 2050, you might think that means I'm safe from hail, right? It's going to be too warm for a storm of ice. Unfortunately, 
the warming trends actually mean that in quite a few areas, we're just going to get larger hail because the hail will spend more time popped up at that high altitude where it grows in size. So here's where the hail is most likely to come down and whack us as we move forward in this century. This figure is a little hard to read. I'm going to talk it through. You can see we're looking here at a study with findings regarding hail days and hail diameter. This figure here, it's just the figure for change in hail size. You can see the delta ds over there. That's what that means. I cut the figure so we're not looking at an overwhelming number of maps. The hail days had a clear enough trend. I figured I'd just say it. Most of the country, you're looking at two to four more hail days a year. Our friends in the southeast, they get some good news for a change. They have a drop in hail days, particularly around Florida, where there's a major drop in hail days. Looking at the Midwest, it's not a big surprise. We usually get a lot of bad weather. We're looking at more hail. On this figure, we can see more big hail, particularly in the spring. Look at all that red around Iowa and Nebraska. But we're pretty resilient against hail here because it's not like this is a new threat. New threats are the most dangerous, right? If you're not used to them, you don't know how to respond. And that's why, even though it's obvious that there's more of a hail situation in the Midwest and the Northern Great Plains where it's already fairly common, I want to focus on emerging hotspots in the Northeast. You'll see a hotspot in Maine there on the spring map and a hotspot around New York and Pennsylvania in the summer. Those places are historically not big hail hotspots and they're not used to large diameter hail either. And the areas otherwise have so much going on that's positive. I mean, people are definitely going to dig in here because they're great. I want you to know this weather outlook, it doesn't take away from these areas resilience potential. Not at all. It's just a heads up about an oncoming challenge where you might otherwise not have had awareness. Speaking of new threats, we're going to move over towards talking about tornadoes now. So nobody likes tornadoes, but if you grew up in a region of the country that gets them, your experience is probably similar to mine, where you have a plan to respond to a tornado, you respect tornadoes, but you're not exactly afraid of them. You know they're going to do their thing, you're going to get out of their way. But I checked in with some friends in emerging tornado regions who didn't have that kind of childhood training and familiarity. And I was surprised to find how viscerally people are frightened of tornadoes because they don't know what to do. And that makes sense. If you're not prepared for a threat, if you don't have a way to get to shelter, that is very scary. So let's look at some maps and see where we need to build tornado culture, reduce that fear. This figure is letting us look at a variety of different climate models. You want to focus on the middle two. Those are the closest to RCP 4.5. We put all the models up here though, to show that even with the uncertainty in the modeling, there are major projected changes to the tornado landscape. We can see the center of tornado activity is moving, and it's moving away from areas that are tornado resilient and towards areas that have little to no tornado experience. And that lack of experience really heightens the danger of a big wind event. People aren't going to have the mindset and training where they look for shelter, and they may not know how to identify a safe shelter and buildings in the areas are not going to be as wind resistant as they maybe need to be. If you're in one of these areas where tornadoes are emerging, familiarizing yourself with safe tornado practices is a pretty big deal. Your house, it's probably not going to be able to withstand a direct hit from the tornado. That's not the goal. But keeping you safe from a tornado is. If your home or community lacks tough underground shelters, those save lives and they're not a huge infrastructure investment. Getting involved in that cause locally would allow you to punch way above your weight in building community resilience. And that's especially important because check it out. There's resilient superstars with emerging tornadoes. Pennsylvania right here. You might recall they have a fabulous outbook. And now we can see here major tornado patterns within that context. Parts of Indiana too, they have a really good outlook. And we can see across models, there's a lot of emerging risk in Indiana in the tornado department. This figure, it doesn't mean tons of tornadoes. Look at the day scale there. It's not a huge number of days. This could mean a future where, say, Pennsylvania gets seven or eight more tornado days a year, maybe a dozen tornadoes a year, because some tornado days might spawn more than one tornado. It's a pretty small number of pretty local events. So as you're thinking about your risk in Pennsylvania, is your house likely to be eaten in particular? No. Is the outlook for the region ruined? No. It's just like what I pointed out in that area in northern New England that is so excellent. An increased chance of an extreme weather event doesn't mean stay away. It means know how to respond. Here, it means you might not have thought much about wind before, and it's time to think about wind. The wind events, 
it's not as hard to save people's lives as it is in, God forbid, you know, a big fire or water event. The 2020 derecho, which I experienced here in Iowa, it caused an estimated $11.2 billion in damage. That's a big number for an event with four confirmed fatalities because of tornado-aware culture. People knew how to get to shelter, and even with very limited warning, most people were able to keep safe. Now, moving over to the Atlantic coast, I want to talk a little about bombogenesis. For hail and tornadoes, we were able to build a decent consensus science case, use a broad base of evidence, and that's thanks to the hours our volunteer researcher, Sarah Plotkin, has put in on this project. For those of you with eyes on the Northeast, you ought to know, Sarah's looking out for you and your interests. Although we're working with a more limited evidence base here, she wanted to make sure we covered projections around bombogenesis in these dangerous and unexpected weather events. They pose particularly severe threats to cities like Boston where I want to show you some of this crazy footage from a 2018 bombogenesis type storm. Bombogenesis doesn't only happen in the Northeast, but it's one thing to deal with an unexpectedly giant storm, and it's another thing to deal with an unexpectedly giant storm that causes multiple feet of storm surge. So let's get a map up, pull up places that are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise as we get down towards these areas where the continental shelf is shallower, the slope of land to the sea is more gentle. And let's see where we're expecting changes in bombogenesis trends. In this overlap zone, which uh, really is focusing on the Atlantic coast around Massachusetts, that's where we're especially vulnerable, bombogenesis vents are going to be more likely to cause severe flooding, just like infrastructure trashing levels of flooding. There's good news in this outlook because we're looking at overall less of these storms as we move through the century, but there's bad news in that when they do hit, they're anticipated to be big bigger than we're used to now. And it's worth really pointing out, there's a fair amount of uncertainty in these models. This trend towards fewer of these storms is being criticized by some scientists. They say that these models are underpredicting the number of bomb events compared to historical data. So it's challenging, but this is an area where if you're on the coast, you're already thinking about resilience against sea level rise. When we combine the bombogenesis outlook with the changing projections around typical hurricane paths, we really see that storm surge is a growing threat to much of that highly populated Atlantic coast. We know many city governments are already responding, but if this is a threat that could impact your home, I want to make sure you have a chance to get your eye on the ball. From what we've reviewed of city adaptation plans, it seems unlikely that most individuals in vulnerable areas will receive buyouts or substantial assistance. So look out for yourself. And thanks for joining us for this extreme weather outlook. Many of us have gotten the message that in the decades to come, extreme weather will become the new normal. As consensus is beginning to emerge around what exactly that new normal will look like, we hope to keep bringing you the information you need to prepare your response. If we can make a realistic assessment of the threats we face, we can grow our hope, and we can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.